Hello and welcome to West Seattle Christian Church Online. My name is Worth. If you are new, welcome. If not, welcome back. Today, I want to teach you one uh, very important way to break down the barriers of race, ethnicity, class, education level, and economic division between yourself and others. And to do that, I want to talk a little bit about Jesus and hospitality. Uh, we think of hospitality today as maybe just catering a meal or throwing a party, maybe making sure you have a guest room in your house or a pull-out couch available at the very least for family or really close friends when they come to visit. You can Google search hospitality, hospitality and you'll get like a bunch of posts and links that have to do uh, with the hospitality industry, like hotels, resorts, cruises. I mean, think Airbnb and VRBO. But I'm not talking about taking a vacation and I'm not talking about how to be an entrepreneur in the hospitality industry. I'm talking about the way of Jesus and the rhythms and practices that he put into action in his life. The way of Jesus that if you want to be like him, you have to study and begin to practice. So as we look at the way of the kingdom of God that Jesus was teaching his followers to live, I want you to see that hospitality is an essential practice that we are to excel at as followers of Jesus. A definition that I like very much for hospitality is this. Hospitality is the offer to extend the privileges of community to those who do not have the standing to expect it, especially those who are vulnerable because they're strangers. So, you know, for example, the time where I most often eat together with others is with my family. My kids expect that our family will provide food for them around the table every night. To them, it's actually not some gift or like some awesome gift of kindness or generosity. They expect it. They think that my wife and I owe it to them that we give them lunch, breakfast, dinner, and snacks and dessert, and sometimes go out to a restaurant or a coffee shop or to get donuts or wherever. But if and when I offer this kind of meal to someone who is not in my immediate family, the opportunity to share in a meal with me, one that I've prepared or taken them out to eat, but especially if our family has prepared it and invited them over to eat around our table, then what I'm actually doing is this. I'm inviting them into my family for a short period of time or maybe even for a longer period of time occasionally. Hospitality means I'm offering someone other than my family or close friends to identify with me and my family, to treat them like an insider to our family. And don't check out when I say this, but this means that you need to give generously of your financial resources and your time. Oh no, not that. I mean, hospitality is giving the gift of privilege across the divide of difference that we have with others. And the more we plan and act this out, the more our world and the world of others changes for the better. Hospitality is rooted in the idea that God shows humanity hospitality all of the time. It goes all the way back to Genesis where God is supremely hospitable in the very act of creation, of placing humanity in the garden and giving them, giving us everything that we need. He essentially lays a table before them and makes space for them in his reality and then says, what's mine is yours. If you fast forward to Jesus and we see how he went about his entire ministry on earth, dependent upon the hospitality of others. He depended upon others for clothing, shelter, food, resources, for travel, etc. And he showed his disciples this way of life not in order to press themselves on others in a rude way and therefore becoming a burden, but helping them understand that God's going to provide what they needed. And counter to that, we also see in the early church following that pattern extremely well by sharing everything and making sure everyone had everything they needed, which it says in Acts 2. And it, and it goes on to say that more and more people were added to their number daily to the church because of this. Make no mistake about it, it's because of hospitality, because of caring for others and sharing with other people. And they also modeled hospitality around the act of eating in revolutionary ways, making meals, sharing meals. And they got so good at it that it threatened the Roman Empire. Around 112 AD, Pliny the Younger, who was the Roman governor of what is now modern-day Turkey, he wrote a letter to Emperor Trajan where he was basically asking for advice on how to deal with Christians who were always getting together and eating meals and feeding everybody in the neighborhood, in their homes. Why was he concerned? Well, this group was winning people over to the way of Jesus by taking care of others, regardless of their ethnicity, their social, political, or economic status. They were feeding everybody and taking care of everybody. Hospitality 
was certainly a thing that was practiced by the Romans, but it was typically practiced for those that you deemed important, i.e. only those who could give you something in return. That's not something people would do today, is it? I mean, Paul reminds the early Christians in Galatia not to act this way. He says in Galatians 5 verses 13 through 14, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, these Jesus followers were breaking down the walls uh, by showing their love and care for other human beings, by practicing the way of Jesus. If you want to inspire devotion amongst the masses, this was it. I mean, make no mistake, it was a threat to the empire. The empire demanded the loyalty and devotion of the people to the emperor, not to Jesus. And the first Christians did this so well that eventually the empire capitulates to Christianity, which is both good and bad, and that's a topic for another time. But the church grew at an amazing rate, uh, and the evidence for why this happened points to this radical hospitality that the early Christians had. And you may have heard this before, maybe not, but during the plagues, Christians took care of strangers who were sick and dying, and often the Christians got sick and died themselves. This kind of hospitality and welcome was absolutely unheard of, and it made a huge impression on the people around them. Why? Because hospitality is the way we actually see the world. It's the way we see other human beings as they actually are, marked and made in the image of God. Paul said it really simply in Romans, in uh, chapter 12, to the early followers of Jesus who were in the capital of the Roman Empire. He, said, he starts in verse 9 and says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. And so what I want you to see here is that the early church, the early Christians, they developed a reputation, a reputation of love and hospitality. And so must we. Most of Jesus' teachings and examples about the kingdom way, this way of life that he was demonstrating, were taught over a meal somewhere as he was traveling someplace or going throughout town, eating meals and giving and receiving hospitality, like with the woman at the well who was cast out and had very little, or with Zacchaeus, who considered, he was considered worthless by his fellow Jews, but who was also in the upper echelon of the economic class and status of his day. He was rich beyond rich. Each time Jesus does this, you begin to see that he is moving towards and welcoming the stranger in his midst. When he engages in hospitality, whether he's giving it or receiving it, he is breaking down barriers of ethnicity, education level, class, economics, race, and between men and women. His hospitality levels the playing field. Everyone's on the same footing or has equal standing. Uh, as brother and sister with Jesus at Jesus' table. What you see him doing is making room. He plans it out, and he's already ready to engage in hospitality, and he's always being prepared to engage in hospitality, which takes a shift in worldview, a shift from always thinking about ourselves first to always thinking of others first, which makes sense, right? I mean, because this is Jesus we're talking about. This is the man who says, leading... Being a leader means being the least of these. Loving others means putting their needs before your own. It means serving from below, not lording it over from above. This is like what uh, the Apostle John says to the early church in 1 John 3, 16 and 17. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them? How can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is what Jesus does for us at the communion table, and it's what he does for us at the cross. He extends hospitality to us when we have no claim on him or, or, and no claim on God. He invites us into his household, and not just as guests. God invites us to be co-heirs with Christ, to be part of the family. 
And it cost him something to do this so that we might have a place at the table. And that is why hospitality is at the core of following the way of Jesus. It will cost us something. It is integral to who we are. Which brings us to our main text for today in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31. It says this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he'll say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. And I needed clothes. And you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So Jesus was always ready to engage by welcoming the others into his life and by joining others in their life, how they lived it. It's about cultivating a welcoming presence wherever and whenever you are. When he says these words in Matthew 25, you hear the echo of hospitality, of groups of people who are not welcome, groups, frankly, that most people today in our midst fit into somehow, though you might not know it or see it at first. The poor, the sick, orphans and widows, foreigners, sojourners, the lonely, and those who are imprisoned or held captive, whether that's literally or in some other way, they're held in some form of bondage, they're trapped. And and side note here, it's really important, and unfortunately it needs to be said, and we'll just keep saying it here at West Seattle Christian, on that foreigners thing, if you're a Christian anywhere in the world, but especially here in the United States, and you treat people who are other than you, people of color or any ethnicity other than your own, if you treat them with hate or contempt, whether in word or in thought or in deed, then you are not following the way of Jesus. And it pains me to say that, but it needs to be said. The prophets of the Old Testament identify these others, these groups, as those who require some special care and welcome. And Jesus picks up that call and he lives it out and demonstrates it for his disciples and everyone else how to do this. So in this teaching from Matthew 25, which was a core teaching for the early church, he says to them and he says to us, when you extend hospitality and welcome uh, and give special care to the least of these, you do this to me. Jesus identifies the stranger in our midst as Jesus himself. And when we welcome others into our midst and make room for them, we welcome Jesus himself. And the point It's not just meeting the physical needs of others, but the emotional and spiritual needs as well. The need for love, the need for community, the need for a family. What Jesus is calling us to, what he's calling us to practice, is providing the privilege we automatically give to our family or those who are part of our community or our closest friends. That privilege, he says, give that to those who are outsiders, those who are not yet part of the community. 
And Jesus shows us this over and over again. Like when he feeds the 5,000, when he tells the disciples to feed them, it's a command to provide hospitality and care. It's a command, and it makes no sense to the disciples. Why? Because they're looking around at all these folks who are others, who are in need, who are poor, because they're caught up in their own needs and wants and desires, in their own comfort, and they don't think that they're obligated to provide for these people. They don't see how it will benefit them in return. So why go to all the effort? The reality is that Jesus wants his disciples to treat this crowd of outsiders, of lonely people with real needs. He wants his disciples to treat them like part of his chosen group of insiders. If practicing hospitality means treating those who aren't like us, like family, then it'll change the way we invite people to participate in our community. Let me say that again. If practicing hospitality means treating those who aren't like us, like family, then it's going to have to change the way we invite people to participate in our community. And if that sounds overwhelming, that's fair. I, I recognize that a lot of people have not been taught how to practice this. You don't just jump in and start at the deep end where you're, when you're learning to swim. You build up your knowledge and practice by taking incremental steps until you're proficient. And it helps if you do this with others. This is one of the many, many reasons we practice being family together at our church in our kinfolk groups. So here are some steps for how to engage in hospitality today and to start practicing the art of welcoming. And invite people to lunch after church throughout the week uh, at work. Take them to a restaurant and pay for them. Invite people to your house for dinner. Invite people over for breakfast. Uh, think outside the box and pick a different time. Maybe begin to host a kinfolk group with us. If you're inviting people over to, over to hang out or eat with you, this means you need to make room for these people, figuratively and in reality. You need to physically maybe rearrange your furniture, especially here in West Seattle where the homes are small. You have to make more room, more space. You have to actually get maybe even get rid of furniture. Being hospitable mean, means cleaning your house. It means really cleaning it, getting rid of the clutter, going out of your way to make others feel at ease. Invite others to do errands with you, especially those who aren't able to do so on their own. Ask others if they need someone to run errands for them and then go do it and deliver it to them. Take care of each other's needs. Mow lawns, clean houses, take the car to the mechanic, change the oil. <laughs> if you're going out of town for a day trip, take someone who is homebound. Take a family who doesn't have the means to go to the movies or to go skiing or to learn how to kayak or to learn how to fish or to go to the fireworks or the 4th of July or whatever. And don't think you have to do it alone. Ask others to get involved in showing hospitality and demonstrating it with you. If you're not part of one yet, join one of our kinfolk groups where you can actually begin to do this practice that Jesus asked us to do. Foster the habit of sitting down face to face with others who become your family and who you share love and life and good food and drink with and do it often. May you begin to engage in the way of Jesus by taking some new concrete steps towards the Christian practice of hospitality. Hospitality means we have a mutual indwelling of God with each other. It's how we have a common participation in the mission and life of God where we meet and receive from each other. It's not just a good strategy for being on mission with God. It's actually not something that's optional to the way of following Jesus. What it is, is an excellent way to walk in the very footsteps of Jesus. And I encourage you to get started. I'm Worth Wheeler for West Seattle Christian Church. Stay rooted and deep in Jesus and produce good fruit, my friends.